This video is going to show how I made a table out of the top of a barrel and a newel post. Uh, a friend of mine, before the coronavirus pandemic started, wanted to uh, make himself a garden with uh, some hops plants that he grew himself. And he, hops plants need really deep containers to grow in because they have a deep tap root. So he wanted to use most of a barrel. So uh, I helped him out cutting off the tops of two barrels. And uh, to, for my efforts, he gave me one of the barrel tops to do with as I pleased. I decided I was going to make a table out of it. And I wanted to have a single support in the middle, and I wanted it to be a nice turned support, but I didn't have the facility to turn the support myself. So I went to the hardware store and bought a turned newel post. And so what you can see here is I'm cutting the knob off the top of it. I still have the knob. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but there it is. And then I'm going to cut the bottom off and actually reuse the wood from the bottom of the newel post to make the uh, base of the table. So in the end, the only thing I bought for this project, well, I, I bought a few things, but the main thing I bought was this newel post. I'm going to use as much of it as possible on the, on the project itself. You can see I'm scoring the cut marks before I start with my uh, box cutter. That helps it reduce tear out. And I'm using my Japanese saw to do these cuts. I just find it to be much neater and it has a smaller kerf, so you know, it's wasting less material. Overall, I just I like the Japanese saw. It does a good job. There you go. I got the newel post cut down, so that's going to become the central central support for the table. Since it's got this raggedy barrel top to use as a tabletop, I was going for a kind of a a pub feel. So I wasn't going for a super finished, nice look. I wanted the the rest of it to match the barrel top. So what you can see here from the bottom of the newel post that I cut apart is that it's actually made from two pieces of wood that are glued together. I believe this is poplar, and uh, I needed them back apart again. So what I'm going to do is cut it right down the, the seam line on my bandsaw to produce two relatively equal pieces. This little bandsaw here wasn't really intended for this kind of resawing, but it does the job okay. I, I have a really nice blade on it I bought from a local place. Um, has a, a carbide has carbide teeth on it, which, which really helps. There it goes. This actually took a really long time. This is at 6x speed, and I've cut out a bunch of the cutting, so you can imagine. It didn't sound great either, but got it done. And I don't have room for a, a planing machine, so I do all of my planing when, when I have to do it with a hand plane. So what I'm doing here is uh, clamping the two pieces together. I'm going to use my handy-dandy Stanley number 4 plane to get them flat on the side that had just been sawed. Of course, I didn't get it exactly even, so one of them is thicker than the other. Was it gets flat first, and then I'm going to um, continue planing across both of them until they should eventually be the same thickness or thereabouts. And of course, everything's not perfect. I'm not going for perfect here. I'm going for you know well-used bar kind of feel. Also, I'm kind of lazy, and so I'm not going to spend as much time on the planing as I might need to to get everything exactly perfect together. But what I've done is uh, rotated the pieces, flipped them around so that they're not in the same orientation so I can plane some more and get them more evened up. What I really need is just two flat faces. So I'm pushing them together to see which two faces are flat and I can uh, index to one another. So I got that. So now what I'm going to do is mark them in the middle because I'm going to cross them and put a lap joint in the middle to fit them together so that they make a nice X to be the base of the table. So I'm marking out the middle of each piece now using my speed square and my uh, adjustable square as needed. Now what I'm doing is, is marking the lap joint location with the box cutter as my marking knife. And then I've got um, then I've got a nice little mark depth gauge to mark how deep they need to cut. So I'm cutting each one of them in half because I did get them to be about the same thickness. So they'll lap together and, and make a single cross that is uh, one thickness. <laughs> and then playing a little music on my Japanese saw before I get started there. So what I got to do here is actually cut down just to the half thickness mark I made on each side of the lap joint. I'm going to try to get it as even as possible. Again, these Japanese saws are really nice for this kind of work. I know that uh, traditional Western joinery would use a different kind of a saw for this, but this Japanese saw works great. I'm going to combine Japanese and Western tools here. I'm going to use my chisel to, to cut out most of the waste wood in the middle of the lap joint here, I'm going up from the marking so I don't cut too deep. Use the chisel to get it mostly cleaned up, and then I pull out my router plane. I 
not a um, not a super fancy hand tool woodworker, so I've got one of the early router planes that doesn't have as many of the gigaws on it, but it was cheaper for me to buy. It does the job. It's a Stanley. It's got an 1884 patent mark on it, which I'll show in a minute. This is where those you know power routers came from, where these these old router planes like that, 1884. Every now and then you see somebody sees that 84 on it and they think it's 1984. And they're like, I didn't know this, these planes were made this recently, but no. That's a venerable plane, that is. Yep, so now you can see how it's coming together. I'm just uh, test fitting everything. So that's the test fit of the base. And then I got to put the barrel top on and that's what it looks like. That's a mock-up. So now everything's got to actually get glued and screwed together so it'll be permanent. And I'm going to glue this lap joint on the base using plenty of wood glue once it's glued up it's essentially one piece it's interesting the chemistry you know you can look this up if you want to but the wood glue is um, made of uh, I believe it's polyvinyl acetate PVA and it actually um, reacts with the with the wood and to create a bond that ends up being stronger than the bond within the wood itself so if you have a properly glued uh, joint, then the wood will break before the joint will on the glue. Now what I'm going to do is round off the edges of this cross base because it, it just looks too sharp. Um, that look look great, so I want them to be rounded off. And then rather than using the power router for this, I'm doing it with my hand plane. And you can see I'm getting tear out on one side. Really, there are ways I could have done this. It would have been neater without the tear out. But again, I'm looking for this kind of weathered kind of feel. I don't want it to be too perfect. Is that because I have a vision or is it because I'm lazy? Well, both of those probably. So there you go. I'm going to do this for all four of them. It would have been faster to use the router to do it and probably neater too, but then I would have had to use the router. It would have made a bunch of noise and a bunch of dust. This way I get shavings instead of the dust. I guess I get a little dust because I'm cleaning it up at the end with the sandpaper, but not too much. So there you go. And then I did have one piece of tear out that was really big, but didn't come all the way off. So I glued it just to, to keep everything together, let it sit overnight. Now I'm going to work on the barrel top. Because we cut the barrel apart, the tension on the staves keeps those hoops in place and the, there's no tension anymore. So over time they would wiggle loose and eventually that hoop would pop off and it would all come apart. I've seen some barrel top tables where they've removed the hoop and they're just using the, um, the top of the barrel itself. And it looks, a lot slicker than this, but I was looking for something that looked kind of dive bar launchy, so this worked out. So what I'm doing is I'm going around with my drill and I'm drilling out a hole in each of the um, staves and the hoop, and I'm going to drive a, a metal screw in through the hoop into the stave, and that actually holds everything together. Once I did that, everything was a lot tighter and the felt a lot less wobbly. Before I'd driven these screws in, you could feel those individual staves kind of wanting to work their way loose, and it became solid after I put these screws in. Now I'm using an old uh, <laughs> Greek uh, geometry trick to mark the center of the barrel. Uh, if you put a right angle on there and then a diagonal across it, you can get a line that fits a diameter. Um, and then you put two of those, you've got the cross mark as the center of the circle. So I've uh, made my hole. I'm going to be using these. Um, I'm going to be using these uh, carriage bolts. I guess they're not carriage bolts. They're um, they're lag bolts to to secure the barrel top and the base to the newel post. So now I'm marking the center of the newel post so that I can get these in there. And then I I bought a drill bit. That's the right drill bit for. You can see me showing there. That's the right drill bit uh, diameter for these uh, lag bolts. And then I marked it with tape how deep I need to go so that the lag bolt won't bottom out into the newel post and crack it. Then I have to drill all the way through uh, to get that depth. And this was probably the worst part of the whole process just because the sound that the drill made as it went deep into the wood was, was incredibly uh, painful. A very high-pitched, screechy sound. I discovered that if I, if I knocked the sawdust out of the drill as I went, it didn't screech nearly as much. So I was tapping the sawdust out there as I went. Okay, then I got to make the hole in the bottom, the last part, just like I did in the top. So I'm going to use a, a marking with my um, 
with my auto punch. Then I'm going to use a Forster bit to drill out the space for the bolt head and washer. And then switch back to the correct size drill to drill out for the middle. So now it's ready to go. I'm just cleaning up the tear out on that hole on the other side with the hand plane. There wasn't a lot and nobody will see it anyway, but I want it to be flush. So now i got to drive this lag bolt into the base to start with. Once I got it far enough in, I could actually get it onto the newel post. I had to clamp the newel post down to the bench and then I could actually kind of spin it on until I got them snugged up together and then drive it all the way through. I had to use a socket wrench to get the last little bit because that ratcheting box end wrench won't go down into the recess. And then to keep it from turning off later, I drove two uh, wood screws, pretty long wood screws, through the base and into the newel post um, diagonally opposite one another. That just keeps it from unscrewing if somebody puts torsion onto the tabletop. So it'll stay secured. Now I'm doing the same thing to the top. I'm driving this lag bolt through uh, and it all holds together. And I could leave it like that, but it'll be more secure if I also prevent the top from spinning off. So what I'm doing here is I've got some scrap oak pieces. I used oak because the barrel is oak, and I thought if everything was oak together, it would probably expand and contract in more of a reasonable way. And so what I'm doing is taking these oak pieces, and I'm driving a wood screw through each one and into the, the planks of the barrel top so that the barrel top planks are all held together by these oak strips. That helps to keep everything more secure. And then two of them are butted up against the newel post in the middle. That'll keep it from spinning so that if somebody puts torsion on the tabletop, it won't spin free. Now I've got to make this uh, poplar base match the kind of feel of the aged oak top. And what I'm using for that is some walnut colored Danish oil. I like Danish oil a lot as a finish. It's relatively simple and the cleanup is easy. You just have to be careful that you don't cause a fire because the rags that come from it can um, spontaneously combust if you leave them wadded up, especially if you make a big pile of them. The trick is to either put them in water when you're done or leave them out flat. That's what I usually do because they need to have a high surface area so that the, the heat that they produce as the Danish oil crystallizes can dissipate. Just be smart if you're using uh, chemicals of any kind, but uh, those, those oil finishes can be really dangerous and they cause a lot of shot fires, so be careful with those. Now I'm getting set up um, to accommodate the sloppiness and the way I did the woodworking. <laughs> I, I put adjustable feet onto it. And so that way I can make the level, the top of the table level, despite the fact that the bottom of it is kind of wonky a little bit. So I'm just drilling in here uh, four spots to put the, uh, the little inserts, threaded inserts. You see you thread them in with the Allen key. I had to, um, to get them to really start, you have to use a countersink bit to make the top of the hole a little bit wider. And uh, three of them went in just fine, but one of them got caught going in and it kind of tore up and didn't work. So I ended up having to drill it back out, which is what I'm doing here. And then I used a, a dowel to make a Dutchman to fill that hole so I could re-drill it and put another one in. So that's what that dowel is. I'm going to cut off close, but not flush yet. Then I fill the hole with wood glue using type bond three here is what I had on hand and let that dry overnight. Once it's dried up, then I use my Japanese saw to cut that Dutchman off flat. A Dutchman is just what you call it when you fill a hole with wood to, to make it solid again so you can recut for something new. Then re-tap it and drill back through for the the insert. <laughs> I screwed it up and drilled all the way through and came out the other side, but rather than going ahead and doing the Dutchman thing again and again, I just decided I would leave the hole going through the other side. I felt like it, you know, it works with the sort of rustic aesthetic here. So now I have to make the top of the table level. And the floor here in the workshop is pretty level, so I wasn't too worried about it. But then again, it's going in a room where the floor might not be as level. So, so what I'm doing here is, is trying to to adjust those adjustable feet until I get uh, level bubble on the the bubble level perpendicular. So I've put it two different ways. Every way it's level. That means it's done. So there there we go. Barrel top table. You know, all I bought for it was this newel post uh, and the lag bolts. So total outlay was like fifty dollars maybe. So that was a nice newel post. And I had all the rest of the screws and stuff flying around. Oh, I guess I bought those feet too, but they were cheap. They were only like uh, 10 cents each or something. So not that big a deal. Uh, and it's got a lot of uh, great kind of aesthetic. 
So if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more stuff about me making things, figuring out things as they go, please subscribe to the channel. Like if you enjoyed this video, please give me a like. Take a second to drop out a full screen and like it. Um, if you got an idea how I could do it different, give me a comment. Let me know. I appreciate it. Or if you're working on something similar, let me know. And the thing I like the most about this barrel top is that it has the 007 on it. So that's where I'm going to end up. 007. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it.